Um, I think the best thing is just jump straight in. So uh, has anyone got a question? Or I can start you off with the conversation. Anyone burning questions? OK, yes, sir. So, um, you mentioned about diversity in ETFs. Yeah. Isn't too much diversity a bad thing? Because you don't know whether to go long or short, make those sort of decisions. Um, did everyone hear that question? Sorry. OK, sorry. So would, would you go get a microphone? Apologies about that. I was just asking, um, in relation to ETFs, is, is too much diversity a bad thing? Because predictability becomes a, I would imagine it would become a problem if you have too much diversity. If you look into the sort of academics of, uh, of modern portfolio theory, which was originally um, a subject of the Markowitz, named after the Nobel Prize winner Markowitz in um, 1952, he was the first that came up to, with this product or, or, or this concept of mean variance. Um, and effectively, what the concept said was the more diversification you have in your portfolio, the better. Um, you can't have too much because if you have 100 instruments which have, are totally uncorrelated, the predictability of, of your return becomes that much more certain. I know it's a, it's, it's a, so, so in truth, the more, the more diversification you have, the better. And that's, that's a fact, unfortunately. In reality, it's a sort of a curve which goes like this. So you don't need 100 instruments. You can pick up 90% of that benefit by holding around about 10. Um, and that's what most of the research says. So yes, you don't have to have, you don't have, to have a huge amount of, of product in there. But you do have to have around 10. Critically, they have to be non-correlated. And as soon as they are correlated, of course, the benefits start to dissipate. I think the other way to think about the large number of products is it just gives you greater choice. So it isn't about buying a 1,000 ETFs. It's about having the choice of the however many hundred that you have. So you can actually target the allocation that you want in a specific market. So, sorry, you mentioned your, you mentioned your wife's um, fund. Yeah. Um, and that she had all, effectively had all her eggs in one basket yeah. because of globalization or whatever it is. Yeah. The, the um, Asian market, the American yeah. market, the European market, they go up yeah. and down, they seem to follow each other. Yeah. yeah. But I would think that predictability is a good thing. But um, so, so just back to the original question is to, you know, if you, don't, if you have too much diversity, how can you make a judgment call on whether you're going to go long or short? for a fund? Um, the problem with my wife's portfolio is that um, it's f sourcing and finding that diversity. Um, most of the you, you know, big brand name funds that we'd be familiar with today um, on the high street that's probably typically in your portfolio, because of the, they don't want to fall out of step with each other, they all buy BT, they all buy Rolls Royce, they all have pretty much the same allocation. So although you think you've bought an Aberdeen product and you've been an Artemis product, you bought this and that, if you've really boiled it down and do the stats, you've got the same thing. So you've got, you've, <coughs> no, there's no diversification there. You may then buy some bonds, and that's typically been the principal diversification instrument over the last 20 or 30 years. There's real concern at the moment with interest rates virtually at zero, the bonds can only go down. So if the interest rates were to go up, equity markets would go down, and bonds were to go down, you've got zero diversification benefits currently in your portfolio. So it's a, we're at a very critical juncture at the moment. Whereas if you start to add alternatives, and I'll use that broadly as an asset class, which are non-correlated with those two, then you've got a chance of improving what they call your risk-adjusted return over time. OK. Uh, any more questions at all? OK, one at the back there, please. Just to follow on that question, if uh, global markets are increasing in their correlation, why wouldn't that also be evident within the ETF world? Because the ETFs um, cover so many disparate sources of return, um, currencies, commodities, um, short, leveraged. And I'm not necessarily, have, I know it's somewhat difficult to build that portfolio, but they are there, and this is probably going to be the next stage of the, of the revolution. How can we incorporate more alternative ETFs into a portfolio? So what we do at our company, as I said, we build these buckets. Let's say we've got 12 buckets of complete diversification, each one different from each other. The biggest bucket by far is equity, because all the 80% of the ETFs are equity. They all fall into that bucket, and we pick just one. And then we pick one bond. We picked when you get into the world of commodities and currencies, these are all doing things which are totally unassociated or, or 
completely diverse from equities to bonds. Yeah, I think also if you look at alternatively weighted um, ETFs, smart beta type of products, they will be less correlated to the headline indices. So again, that's providing a, a different source of alpha for investors. So they won't be as highly correlated. You know, a, an alternatively weighted US equity ETF will have a, high, a correlation to the S&P 500, but it won't be one-to-one. -one. So you do add some diversification there and you're not buying, as it were, standardized products which move the same way as the main markets. I see, as, as sort of, just to follow on, I sort of presume by, you know, we're talking that there's circa sort of 1,000 products listed on the, mm -hmm. on the market. That would suggest that, um, you know, if I wanted to invest in Europe, there is, it's not just a case of, you know, there's four ETF providers that all the same product. So there well, is, is there some is sophistication. A, there is la well, no, there's large overlap. So when yeah. we say, say we have 1,000 ETFs in Europe, um, and actually I think in Europe you've got 2,000 ETFs. We actually have more ETFs in Europe than we have in the US. There's a, because we have more providers, and you have a lot of national type of providers, they actually duplicate themselves. So you've got, you know, you've got a choice of five or six FTSE 100 ETFs. You've got almost 20 Euro stocks, 50 ETFs. So when you look at that couple of thousand ETFs or ETPs in Europe, there's a huge amount of duplication in there. So the actual asset classes themselves are well covered, but not to the extent that that figure perhaps mm. exaggerates slightly. Okay, okay. Um, there's a gentleman just on the end there, please. Sorry to drone about the same topic, but I heard on a previous um, presentation one of the comments by the speakers was you should invest in something you're familiar with. I mean, I accept your comments about diversification, but if most of us say are familiar with shares, we may not be familiar with commodities or currencies or, um, so how do you get over the, your non-familiarization if, if you want to diversify? Well, I think, I think, I mean, with invest in what you know perhaps is, if you, you starting point is, I started by investing in some shares. I know about, say I know all about the engineering sector, perhaps if, if you say it's you engineering, it's your job, that might be the good starting point. And then you add a broader yeah. view of, uh, you know, a broader ETF product might sit with, um, say, three engineering stocks which you think cover different markets. But it's, I, I don't think it's a case of investing what you know, shares or nothing else. I think it's within the share segment. It's the industries, perhaps, that you know, or the brands you know. Or sort of the risk that you know. So I, that would involve not perhaps investing in, say, frontier markets or something that you're not comfortable with in terms of the risk of those underlying securities. So perhaps it is a you know, large cap European basket of stocks where you're familiar with the types of names and therefore the risks of those underlying equities. Yeah. Just say that Nizam is with um, an issuer called Wisdom Tree who have grown enormously in the United States, but with a, if I may, a yeah. reputation for doing you know, slightly, um, or what was called smart beta, which are these more intelligent ETFs. And I think the take up has yeah, been It's been great. I mean, the, the firm's yeah. grown to $63 billion in you know, a matter of years. It was launched in 2006. At the end of 2012, they only had about $15 billion of assets on the management. So the strategy's taken off people's awareness of that type of product has in, increased incredibly. Mm. And that's but, what we hope to bring to Europe. <laughs> and education is a big part of it, mm. you know, and uh, it's all collectively as an industry, the ETF industry have to do a better job yeah. at, you know, as you say, getting, getting you comfortable and, and confident to go out and explore. Mm. Okay, next question, please. Yeah. Okay, gentleman just here. Can ETFs distort the market they are tracking or the index they're tracking by the sheer weight of capital and money that the ETF is buying? No, I mean, that's a, dis that's a sort of discussion that's been had over many years, even with relation to index funds. And actually, index funds, which are passive instruments, are actually far larger than ETFs. So, you know, ETFs as a proportion of that sort of passive index strategy is actually still quite small. Um, large institutions use passive funds. Um, so I don't think there's a scale at which ETFs themselves can actually distort the market. And certainly no more than, shall we say, you've got a large active manager with a very large position in a single stock. You could argue that that manager and that manager's desire to perhaps either increase that position or, or decrease it um, can have a disproportionate effect on a single stock. Thank you. Okay, gentlemen, just there. Thank you very much. I enjoy your talk this afternoon. Um, I just want to ask the panel, panel to comment on the fact that I think there are different types of ETF, aren't they? There are some ETF which are backed by real asset, assets. Some are synthetic, which are mixed up of some forward contracts. And would, would you like to comment on whether they, they, would that explain, in the case of the latter, the lack of correlation between the Maybe the, the, the performance of the of the of the of the indices and, and the actual price of the, of the ETF. 
So I guess if you look at the trends in the ETF industry and you look at, say, the swap-based ETFs that you're talking about, they are more prevalent when it comes to having exposure to commodities because you, can only, you can't do that physically, typically, as I said, apart from things like gold or some precious metals. So you'd have swap-based um, ETFs there. They will track probably a futures contract, so they will be exposed to backwardation or contango or some of the features of the commodity market. Um, physical funds, like physical ETFs, typically for equities or fixed income, you, they're probably the easiest product for people to understand because essentially you can see exactly what you own in the fund. So you don't have to figure about, figure about what the derivative is, what the collateral is, and some of the other complexities. To be fair, um, we, all these products are used as ETFs. They, they meet all the standard guidelines. It's a question of buying what you understand. And if you're comfortable buying a physical fund because you can understand exactly what the holdings are, it will do as good a job as a swap-based fund, but a swap-based fund might be slightly more difficult to understand. So buy the product you understand, and if that's a physical fund, which I think typically for a retail investor is a far easier product to understand, then buy that and stick with that. Buy a swap-based fund if it accesses a market that you can't actually do in a physical way. I just add that um, a few years ago there was some concern that these synthetic or swap-based ETFs um, provided sort of undue or overexposure to the swap provider. The industry has done a fantastic job over the last three or four years in fixing that problem so that many of these quote-unquote synthetics are now fully cash collateralized and or have got multiple swap providers. So I think that that area of concern has seemingly disappeared from yeah. ETF world. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question. The gentleman just here. There are some investment trusts like personal assets or capital gearing that take a contrarian view um, of the market and do something really the different and eccentric. Um, is there an equivalent in the ETF uh, market of that? I think the answer is yes. I mean, you as as the market becomes relatively saturated, so all the market cap weighted indices are covered by multiple issuers, as you've got some of the smart beta um, indices coming up, you will find someone with a particular style that will be systematic. So you can be contrarian in a systematic way, wrap that up into an index and then create an ETF that tracks it. And you see some of those strategies, mainly in the US. I don't think the, the European market's evolved enough to sort of accept that just yet. But I'm sure we'll start to see those type of strategies come into Europe. But you definitely have you know, a plethora of quite unusual strategies if you look at the US market. I suspect it's only a matter of time before we see some of those come across to Europe. I guess with that for So that's a sort of like a deep value strategy or something, as you say, completely contrarian. You will find some of those issues, as I say, exist in the US and at some point they'll issue product in Europe too. So as I presume with that, you would have to be prepared to pay a slightly higher cost because there must be some sort of... Um, it depends. I mean, I, it, it's quite clear even when you look at the slightly funkier ETFs, yeah. they, they clearly are lower cost than the equivalent active fund or unit trust. So, you know, you'll still get most, you know, the benefits that you see in an ETF, you'll get those in, even in those slightly contrarian, unusual strategies. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question, please. Any more questions? Or would you want me to jump? Well, I'd, I'll jump into one because there's one that I always thought was a bit strange is... Um, Say you're, you're looking to build a portfolio and you're, you're quite new and perhaps you've only got, um, you know, say you want to invest sort of 300 pounds every month. You go, some of these ETFs cost, a single sort of share in an ETF will cost 150 pounds, 200 pounds. And I think sometimes you think, well, um, it, it, and it's a psychological thing. Mm. What, what happens if I've, I haven't got, I've only got enough to buy one, but I want to, and uh, why has the pricing gone so much higher than perhaps, um, you know, uh, your average share might go from extremely like under a penny to even the highest is like you know, 50 quid or something. I guess it's a fun, but I'd also say I think most of the traditional ETFs that people will use have got um, prices which are in the sort of this, you know one pound to ten pound yeah. type of range. When we launch our ETFs in Europe, we kind of make sure that they've got a price range which fits both an institutional and a retail perspective. Um, and perhaps some of the products and some of the ETPs, so some of the leverage products because of the gearing in them, end up in some quite strange price brackets like the £100 or something yeah. like that. But most funds and ETFs, and ETFs of funds, uh, tend to have what I would call pricing, which is quite you know, easy for a retail investor to access. Yeah. Okay. I'd just add that you know, typically with institutions having been the largest sort of um, users of ETFs, then you know, having a high-priced uh, ETF is not an issue. It mm -hmm. lowers transaction costs, etc. So if I'm an ETF issuer looking to target institutions, I'm not going to give them a penny stock. Hmm. Um, I'm going to give them something chunky. But I think you're at, you raise a great point, and I think as we as we open the retail floodgates, most issues will recognise that and they'll come out with 
you know, products that are acceptable for a retail marketplace. Yeah, okay. Um, is there any other questions that are stimulated by this at all, or I could keep casting some? Okay, so we, we, I mean, the, the other thing was just the name Exchange Traded Fund. It, it's, it's, you know, I think if you're an, uh, an experienced investor, you might understand it, for, but from a new person, you know, someone inexperienced, you think, what on earth does it mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, is there, do you think that the industry shot itself in the foot by adopting this sort of garbagey name, or, or is it, there really isn't something else that they can come up with? Well, it's a fund that trades on exchange. Yeah. I reckon ETF works quite well yeah, in that context. Um, it's better than an oik or. A <laughs> well, I suppose yes. Yeah, the whole industry is full of full of garbage. But I just, I just yeah. the, the industry is pushing for something that's very low cost, yep. uh, easy to do, and I, I just don't know. If you can come up with a name, well, I'll yeah. definitely <laughs> I'll use it. Um, I mean, oh, obviously. A question. Okay, a question. Uh, Sorry, quick question. Um, like you were saying, if you want to diversify your portfolio, you could go for something like commodities, um, ETF commodities. The biggest problem I have is, though, there's a lot of commodities out there from cotton, cocoa, oil, real uh, niche um, commodities. Where can I find the information to know if they're going to go up, down? Like, how, how am I meant to get that information? Well, I think, I mean, obviously, you, you, so if you, if you start with the whole commodity space and you think... Um, you, you look for supply and demand is, is the starting factor for these. I mean, I say places like Bloomberg, uh, the Financial Times, Shares Magazine, we, we comment on what the uh, sort of market and banking analysts will be trying to forecast for, for demand. You need to tie that up with economic figures. Um, there's actually quite a lot of commentary about commodities yeah, out there. A lot, of the, a lot of the issuers provide some element of background commentary and research as well. So it's definitely worth visiting the actual issuer's website yeah. um, in order to do that if you're looking at particularly niche commodities. I mean, per personally, I, 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 as a journalist, I write a lot about mining companies. And I think if you go to some of the big, look at the big FTSE 100 players like Glencore, Rio Tinto, the chances are they'll be involved in quite a lot of these commodities. They'll issue presentations on their websites and will we'll have their forecasts on there of where they think, or commentary, about where they think certain things are going. Um, but you know, commodities is a very unpredictable industry. Um, you know, certain things like soft commodities, uh, you know, uh, wheat and that stuff, it's all affected by the weather. It's extremely difficult to, to forecast accurately. Um, so really, if you're gonna invest in a commodities sphere, there are exchange traded products that perhaps would offer you a, a basket of them yeah, if you want to there are broadly diversified um, commodity yeah. indices as well but i mean it, um, but unfortunately there's no straight answer of uh, um, yeah, this is going to go up this is going to go down if it was we'd all be rich so. <laughs> <laughs> um, for absolute niche um, etf products then for a beginner or a novice say something like i don't know cotton or cocoa would you stay away from that then and Go for the main com commodities if you are going to do that. If you're, if you're for like an absolute gold or beginner oil. in commodities, you should look at a diversified basket. And uh, there are a number of issues who have diversified indices. Something well known like you know S and P GSCI, uh, down you know Bloomberg have got commodity indices. There are products that track very broad commodity indices. Some of them can be X Energy if you don't want to have a, uh, an exposure to oil. So you know, have a look around at the broadly diversified um, commodity indices, and you will typically find that there will be a, an equivalent or certainly relevant product that will help you track that. And that makes a lot more sense if you want a commodity exposure rather than having a exposure to a single niche, you know, cocoa, yeah. cotton, or whatever. I take a slightly different, um, um, if I may, with my panel members. It's uh, I wouldn't waste any time in trying to figure out where these commodities are going to go because even the experts, and I traded commodities for 25 years, you'll never figure it out. You know, even if you're right, the market will probably make you wrong. So I would avoid any single commodity um, unless you've got a really good money management system, and I could talk to you about that later, but that's a whole different, that's a whole different conference. Um, but one thing I would look at potentially uh, there are ETFs which track what are called commodity trading advisors, and these are systematic um, trend-following um, uh, funds who predominantly focus on commodity markets and some currency markets, and um, there are some very big names, some very, very successful companies, so I don't have the name of one off the top of my head, but um, they are out there, and, and that might be the best way to gain commodity exposure. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, what's, what, what's, is, is there something um, that's happening in the industry? Is there certain sectors where people are trying to create new products because they want, it's like say the technology sector, they're trying to create um, ETFs that trade sort of subsectors of technology specific well, things, or is that just as generic what's happening across the no, industry? No, I mean, you're right in technology. There was um, a US um, product um, tracking cybersecurity um, yeah. companies called Hack. And that raised a billion dollars in sort of six straight months has been incredibly popular. So you're right, in, in, in a marketplace where you've got you know, a wealth of product, people are going to smaller and smaller niches. But actually more interesting product developments are in say places like fixed income where people can understand there's a rate rise coming. Mm. So building ETS which you know, can protect you against rate rises or fixed income products I should say, and strategies that can protect you against rate rises. People looking at, again in the fixed income space, does it make sense to have a fixed income ETF which has exposure to the most highly indebted companies. So a smart way of building a corporate bond ETF is another area that people are looking at. So even in traditional areas, I think there's some innovation that can happen um, just you know, in the index and therefore the ETF space. Mm. Okay. Uh, any other questions at all from anyone? Okay. Yes. Thanks for the second time. I just want to ask you about the how liquid um, are, are, is the market. I mean, for instance, I mean, is there some information we can obtain about for each ETF how many market makers there are, perhaps per ETF? Yes, um, typically on the ETF Look website, and I'm not trying to plug the product, but uh, we list the daily volume. Um, but I think one of the best indicators of liquidity is the bid offer spread. If those are very tight, you can tell there's a very fierce market being made in that product and that's, that's probably the best indicator, quickest way I think of determining um, with, with so many ETFs actually trading over the counter um, and on exchange and off exchange but there are so many market participants whilst there are designated authorised participants to make liquidity, you know, that only encapsulates an amount of the total trading that's going on so maybe the quickest way to to figure out if this is a liquid and deep sort of ETF is just to look at the bid offer spread. Mm. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so I mean, perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll sort of do a, a round up with five minutes left. So, I mean, really, so the ETF industry, there's definitely growing interest in it. Um, obviously, you, you mentioned about the, the IFA uh, potential driver over sort of the coming years. Um, to promote it, obviously there's a range of products, much more a range of products. Um, so really, do you think this is, um, you know, this is a very good place to be? This is good for investors? Or is there a risk that actually there's so many things and um, we're just over, overloading um, the, the investment industry with yet more products? Because let's face it, there's enough funds for people uh, to go in. Yeah, I think the important point is these are funds which do the job that other funds have done before but in a lot better fashion. So you've mm. got transparency, you've got that liquidity, um, you've got significantly lower costs. So are we bringing more products to the market? Clearly. But are they much better products than the traditional products you've had? I think the answer to that is yes. And I think, are we adding value? Yes. So there's a rationale for to be here and, and provide value to, um, to people as we have in this room. I'd say absolutely so. Yeah. So yes, it, you, yeah, new products, but for the right reason. Yeah, okay. I think just to answer, and you raise a very valid point about confusion, uh, and that was one of the slides up there. I think that is an issue that the industry or we the practitioners have to have to work on. We have to make these more accessible. Um, I, you know, as an individual, we would still struggle today to, you know, op feel that you've optimally invested money in a slew of ETFs and that, you're, that you know you're happy with. And I think we've got to keep pushing out the tools and the information to get everyone where they need to be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, great. So if that's uh, if there are no more questions. Um, so thank you ever so much for coming. I hope you find it useful. Obviously, come and visit uh, any of the stands or any of the speakers here if you want to grab some uh, question in private. Uh, thanks very much for coming. Thank you.